This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Hopsteiner, a global leader in the hop industry focused on quality, sustainability, and innovation in new hop varieties and hop products. Contact our brewery sales team to provide you with the hop-related tools you need to craft your next great beer. For more information, visit hopsteiner.com. Additional support provided by... Get to know Proximity Malt. We malt superior, European-style, low-protein varieties grown close to home in Delaware and Colorado. Domestically grown, precisely malted to style. With our team of seasoned experts and two brand-new malt houses, try what's really new in malt. Check us out at www.proximitymalt.com. The only way to really understand how your beer is going to hold up on the shelf on the shelf is is to measure TPO. Today on the show, Mike Feldman and Kevin Sutterth from Hawk join us to talk about TPO. If you've got a dissolved oxygen meter in your brewery, you need to be calculating TPO. And if you don't have a DO meter, God help you in this increasingly competitive marketplace. Mike, Kevin, how's it going? Good, John. How are you today? Great. So we're we're here today to talk about, uh, to focus focus on TPO. And I must admit, I was a little surprised that you guys were so excited to come on the show to discuss the Tokyo Philharmonic Orchestra. I I didn't know you guys were such big fans. Fans of all kinds of music. All right. There we go. All right. From all over the world. Before we get into TPO, let's, let's start off by covering the different types of measurements that a brewer might take on packaged beer with his or her DO meter. Uh, how about explaining what the difference is between shaken and unshaken DO? So the first uh, first thing you're really looking at on a primal level when you're looking at different measurements that you can do in a packaged beer, um, really there's two major things, a uh, shaken DO and an unshaken. The unshaken is really reflective of what has passed from your bright beer tank in through the base of your filler and entered into the system. And then your shaken DO is one where we can drive the pressures of the oxygen out of the headspace in equilibrium with the liquid to give us a representation of what contribution the oxygen in the headspace has in your overall package. Okay. How about some, um, what are some ways that you could utilize shaken and unshaken dissolved oxygen data? So, in an unshaken environment, you can really look to see if all the seals are in place, if there's any other leak potential uh, that could be maybe in the the header header of a filler, uh, other areas where where oxygen may intrude that is not specific to the headspace after the the bottle is crowned or the can has been sealed. Let's say you've got a problem and you've got a spike in your oxygen levels in your beer. Um, let's talk about utilizing shaken versus unshaken um, data to figure out, you know, is most of that dissolved oxygen coming um, from the beer or coming from the headspace? Yeah, so what I, what I like to do when I work with breweries to, to kind of understand that question is I'll have them start first with measuring their bright tank and let's see what is the dissolved oxygen in the tank. Um, and then I'll have them measure an unshaken package. And the, the point of making the unshaken package, if you've done things really well, if you've measured what's in the bright tank and you don't shake the package, that's going to give you an idea of filler pickup. So how well did you evacuate the air from the can or the bottle? How well did you bring that beer over to the, the filler bowl and put it into the package without the influence you know, of the of the headspace. So really that's the first part that a person would want to try to understand with a dissolved oxygen meter is what it in my process 
what is my filler pickup? So if things are done, you know, absolutely perfect, which is never going to be, you know, you're always going to have some pickup of oxygen through that process. You should be fairly close to the dissolved number that you measured in your bright tank to an unshaken package if everything is working properly. And then the difference, the difference for the shaken, now basically you're driving that oxygen that's in the headspace um, into equilibrium with the package. And now if you make that measurement again, let's say you, the best way to do it is to make measurements off of the same filler nozzle because they're going to they're gonna react pretty much the same way every time. So if, it's, if you grab one off nozzle one and you do an unshaken, and then you grab one off nozzle one and you do a shaken. So if the oxygen goes, uh, the value when you shake it, if those values go up in the dissolved portion, then that's a good indication that the issue is coming from your headspace. So your jetter's not functioning or your bubble breaker, you, you're not capping on foam. And then the other the flip side of that is if, you know, if you're shaking your, your sample and your oxygen measurement actually goes down, um, it can be a couple of things. It can be one that you have a very reactive beer that's consuming some oxygen or two that you've done a really good job in the headspace there's not a lot of oxygen there and that oxygen is residing in the headspace and in that case the it, when the number goes down it's demonstrating that that it's shifted from the liquid to the headspace after you've shaken it right exactly and that's we do see that every now and then but that's pretty rare um most of the time what we see during package measurements is that most of the oxygen is coming from the headspace most cases. Now, what's the difference between shaken DO and TPO, and what's the big deal? Why should a brewer care so much about TPO? Yeah, the, the biggest difference there, you know, and I talked to a lot of breweries that tell me they're doing TPO, and then when I ask them about, you know, what are you, what are you doing? They typically tell me, well, we shake the sample and then we make the measurement. But when you shake a sample, what you're doing is you're, you're driving, if you've shaken it long enough, you're driving the gases into equilibrium, meaning not the concentration is the same in the headspace and the liquid, but the partial pressure is the same. Okay, so if, you've me if you make that, um, that measurement in the liquid now, then you are only measuring partial partially what you know oxygen's in the package so you're only measuring what's in the liquid and a lot of times you know looking at how uh, oxygen wants to dissolve into a sample a lot of that oxygen when you get it in equilibrium will actually be in the headspace so by measuring a shaken package and only measuring the dissolve you're getting a false um, sense of security because a lot of that oxygen is not measured because it's in the headspace so that's why you need to know total package oxygen because that's going to give you, you know, how much was in the liquid plus how much was in the headspace, which is really what affects the shelf life. Because as it sits on the shelf, that oxygen you didn't measure that's in the headspace will reabsorb back into liquid and cause off flavors. Just how good of a, a, a or how reliable of an indicator do you think TPO is of beer shelf life? So I really think that, you know, if you look over the years, the big breweries have pretty much standardized on TPO for shelf life. And I think it is a it's really the only way to do it properly, to, to have a really good understanding of of how long um, your beer is going to be able to sit on your shelf before you start to detect off flavors. It's, you just you, if you have in that headspace volume that's in a package is going to change from package to package so you might measure a nice low dissolved number in two separate packages one has a bigger headspace volume than the other well the one with a bigger headspace volume is going to uh, you'll be able to detect off flavors faster because there'll, there'll be a lot more oxygen there that will eventually re-dissolve into the liquid and cause um, this oxidation process to take place so really that's the only way to really understand how your beer is going to hold up on the shelf on the shelf is is to measure TPO. Great. And it's really, John, I think the only thing that you have to control in your process. There's a lot of things that can affect the shelf life of a product, but there's only very few that you can control yourself. You can't control how long a package sits in a in a restaurant or a bar or in a facility. You don't know what temperatures they might be specifically but you can control how much oxygen is in that package on the way out the door. Good point.
So let's get into that that reaction. What happens to the DO that's that's in the package? How long does it take to react um, to the point that it, it's going to affect beer flavor? So I think there's a lot that goes into that. Temperature is always a big thing, and how fast a reaction occurs. But in general, um, to Kevin's point, active yeast can also affect that. If you have, if you're bottle conditioned, you're obviously going to be consuming oxygen much more rapidly. But it is an exponential curve, so you are going to see a lot more rapid decomposition of oxygen initially, and a slowdown over time to where it kind of levels out and plateaus. A lot of the interesting part about that is, is that even though the oxidation occurs, you might not actually start to taste or sense some of those off flavors for 30 to 60 days. I'm just going just gonna to add that, that you know, the oxygen, when you put it into any package, whether it's in a can, a bottle, or a bright beer tank, for that matter, it is always going away via oxidation. So that process of oxidation is actually um, changing forms from O2 to some other form um, by, you know, just oxidizing the flavor components of your beer. And then what happens is that it kind of sets off a chain reaction and that off flavor, that wet cardboard kind of flavor that you get from an oxidized beer takes, you know, like Mike said, it takes 30, 60 days. And, and that really ma- matters uh, on, you know, the temperature that you're storing it. So the hotter it is, the faster you're going to be able to, to taste that off flavor. Okay. Let's talk about some different ways that a brewery could obtain TPO readings. Why don't you catch us up on that? So I think we originally talked about shaken and unshaken values, which gives you some relative information between what's in the liquid and the headspace. Really, the missing part of the equation is how much headspace volume you have. So um, in many cases, the easiest way to do that is going to be using a mass balance. And measuring the weights of your package before you before you measure, and then filling with water after you measure, and using the specific gravity because the mass of uh, water can relate also to volume. Uh, one gram of pure water equals one mil of pure water, and you can really determine the volume of the headspace through that. And then through that and the temperature, we can then calculate the total package oxygen. There's a nice um, article, I think it's an ASBC method, um, that actually goes through that whole process of how to determine headspace volume. And I, I believe it's beer 13 is, is, the, um, is the ASBC procedure for, for the brewers out there that have access to that. Okay, let's talk about the difference between calculated and measured TPO. Okay, so if, you, if you're looking at at a brewery that has um, only a portable option. So any portable meter, it doesn't matter, you know, whose it is. If you have an oxygen meter that um, you can, you can obtain a, an oxygen measurement in one sample. Now that's important when you're using a portable meter. If you're trying to understand the TPO of a package, you can't be measuring multiple samples and kind of dividing them up and getting an average. You really need an analyzer that's going to allow you to make a measurement in a package and understand what that oxygen was in that package. But um, for, the, for a portable reading, you're basically going to be able to, to shake a sample and get it in equilibrium, um, determine the headspace volume, and then pierce the sample with, a, with some sort of piercer, run um, product from the can or bottle through your dissolved oxygen meter, and record the temperature and also the dissolved reading and then you'll need a spreadsheet calculator Um, some of these analyzers will have a built-in tpo calculation built into them you'll feed that information into your um your meter or your analyzer and then or your spreadsheet and that will then determine give you a, a calculated tpo value the difference between that method and a tpo analyzer is that a tpo analyzer is not is going to measure um, the headspace volume. It's going to measure the oxygen in the headspace. It's going to measure the oxygen in the liquid and the temperature. So it's doing all of that for you. So there's less room for uh, inaccuracies. With making a TPO calculated uh, measurement, you you know, with a portable unit, you have to 
make sure that you one got the sample in equilibrium by shaking and two you've actually determined the headspace volume correctly because that's a huge portion of tpo is that headspace volume so that's really the difference between the two the, the tpo analyzer is going to do all that for you and do it very accurately and a portable uh, value or a portable meter is going to require a lot more kind of um, understanding measurements uh, trying to figure out the headspace volume and that kind of stuff and putting it into a calculation coming up you know we see a lot of breweries that you know have never measured and we make a measurement and and they read you know shaken tpo values of you know one ppm that's that's not good I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers Podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. Support for this podcast is brought to you by... ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, triclamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. The District St. Paul, Minneapolis, February meeting and scholarship drive is February 21st at Bueller in Plymouth, Minnesota. District St. Louis meets February 21st at Third Wheel Brewing. District Carolina's Winter Technical Conference is February 23rd at Old Mecklenburg Brewery in Charlotte. The 2019 California Joint Technical Conference is February 28th and March 1st in Paso Robles. District Northern Rockies meets in, meets March 1st in Bozeman. District Philadelphia meets at Flying Fish Brewing in Somerdale, New Jersey, March 8th. District Eastern Canada meets in March Montreal, March 21st. District St. Louis also meets on March 21st at Urban Chestnuts Grove location. Don't miss the Maintaining a Clean Brewery webinar March 28th. It's not too early to start making plans for the 2019 Master Brewers Conference. If you can only make it to one conference in 2019, this should be it. We're really mixing things up this time and heading to the Calgary Convention Center to see how Alberta celebrates Halloween. Check out the full calendar of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. You know, most packaging breweries have a portable DO meter these days in the building. That wasn't necessarily the case five five or so years ago, but thankfully it is now. Um, we've You've kind of done a good job already talking about this, but assuming that you've got a portable DO meter um, in, in-house, in could you just summarize the, the different variables that are needed to calculate TPO? So again, the, the baseline of really what you need is your volume of your headspace, the volume of your liquid, the concentration of your uh, liquid uh, measurement, and the temperature. Okay, Those great. Are, and, then, and then there's obviously things that we had talked about in getting and determining that volume of headspace. Okay. Right, and then also you need to properly equilibrate the sample by shaking. Yeah, let's talk about and, that more um, because I, I remember seeing a, a post that um, your late colleague Chaz Benedict made about not skimping on on shaking. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, how long you need to shake for and how temperature the temperature of the package impacts that? Yeah, so shake times, um, what we typically see out there to, to really get it in, you know, the gases into equilibrium, a cold package is going to want to hold the gases in solution um, just due to, to solubility. So what we find is that in order to really get things in equilibrium, you need to shake a cold sample for five minutes. Okay, so as the sample starts to warm up, some of those gases naturally want to go to the headspace. So on a room temperature uh, sample, you can typically shake those for around three minutes, and that will achieve equilibrium. What happens if you 
um, if you shake for five minutes and do all this, and then you uh, set the sample down and wait five minutes before you take your reading? Yeah, so once you've achieved equilibrium, the, the sample typically, it, you can let, leave it set for, you know, five, six minutes before you'll need to shake it again. So, you know, if you're going to if you're going to shake it and then come back 15, 20 minutes later, probably ought to reshake. Kevin, there may be some brewers out there who don't understand the importance of taking a DO reading right away. Could you comment on that? Well, as far as um, making oxygen measurements in your sample, it's the same thing for, again, in the in the process. Anytime you move beer into a container, whether it be a bright beer tank or a, or, a you know, a a bottle or a can, the oxygen starts to oxidize flavor components of the beer right away. So I, I do go to breweries where they'll make measurement. They'll I'll come in and they'll make measurements in a sample that they they measured or that they packaged uh, a week ago. And the problem is, is that yeah, it looks nice and low, but what happened was that the oxygen has already started to work on the beer and it starts to go uh, go down straight away so you, you have to make that measurement as you're packaging um and you know some beers are more reactive than others but you know best practice really is is to be making those grab sample measurements as you're as you're producing yeah a half-life of uh oxygen could be a day to two days in a lot of beers but if it's a lot of uh volatiles like in an ipa you might get a lot more oxidation quicker or if it's a bottle conditioned it could be 20 minutes i think it's a, it's pretty interesting when you compare uh values and and you look at tpo versus a shaken uh, even one with a normal headspace which is nominal is typically 20 mils on a 12 ounce at 100 ppb could be relatively the same total package oxygen as that same product with 10 mils of more headspace at 75 ppb so even though we've got 25 ppb less measurement in our shaken do because there's 10 mils more of headspace there's the same amount of oxygen affecting your product got it okay uh, let's talk about the best practice for dealing with beers that contain yeast um, obviously the yeast can consume oxygen during shaking uh, what do you do about that well it, from what i've seen the best practice for for if you were looking at TPO is to take the beer directly off uh, the line and measure it with a TPO analyzer that doesn't necessarily need, need to be shaken. So that's one good thing about a TPO analyzer is that, um, you know, if you have one that's going to measure headspace O2 and liquid O2, you can take it straight off the line and make the measurement. If you, if you have a, if you're doing bottle conditioned beers and you don't have access to a TPO analyzer, then, um, you know, and you shake, what happens during the shake process is, is it actually causes the, the oxidation um, to even be more aggressive. So, you know, you, if you're going to do it with a portable analyzer and you want to do TPO, you, you need to do it as fast as you possibly can do it. Shake it, put it on uh, and, and make the measurement. And just know that you probably are still underestimating because at the shaking process just by itself will, will speed up the, uh, the oxidation process. For those that are new to calculating TPO, could you give some benchmarks? What's a good TPO number? What's amazing and what's terrible? Well, I think one of the biggest things we run into when we're talking about TPO is the numbers and what is the magic number. And I think the most important thing to realize, especially if you don't have any instruments for data, is that it's really a benchmark and somewhere to start and work off of. And we work with a lot of facilities that pay attention to everything and their numbers are, are, are not that great. And then we look at other facilities where they're not paying attention to everything, but they end up having a very tight process. So, um, there are some numbers that we see, but it's all really reflective to how far your distribution is and and how long you think that shelf life is and how it's being shipped and handled. Um, some rough numbers, I think, would be on a shaken value, looking at it below 100 ppb, I think, for a craft brewer is, is a pretty good number to look at when you're looking at a bright beer tank, as long as you're below 30 ppb. 20 to 30 ppb is a is a very good number 
uh, to work off of and look for, for minimal pickup on the base of the filler. Kevin? Yep. So t- TPO value wise, so I think you're talking about 100 being dissolved, which is Correct. which is a um, you know that's a that's a good value, but for a dissolved number. But if we're talking TPO, um, kind of best in class that we see out in, in the larger breweries, it, you know, we're seeing somewhere in, you know between um, 60 TPO, which is outstanding, to all the way up to 150 TPO. Okay, and so that those values are are kind of what we see uh, out in the industry, or 60 being really the best. Um, 150, not great, but not terrible. But when you start getting up, you know, two, three, four hundred, then you're you're starting to really, you need to really look at what's going on and see if if you can improve that process. And if you're up in the PPM range, which you know we see a lot of breweries that you know have never measured. And we make a measurement and and they read, you know, shaken TPO values of, you know, one PPM. That's that's not good. But here's the <laughs> thing. You, ne- you never you never knew that until you made the measurement. And now, you know, all right, that value is pretty high. We need to figure it out. Now you have a tool in a, you know, a portable meter to start to understand your process. And that's really the key to a portable analyzer is to understand your process, understand where you know you, you're have where you're doing good and where you have some issues and then you you use that data to drive that number down amen to that and i i think the other important thing to realize is that there are a number of different things you know depending on what kind of bother or canner you have there's a number of different adjustments that you can continue to work with uh and even things like your temperature of what you're packaging in. I've seen some facilities where they start out at 33 degrees or 34 degrees, and they find that they get a better evacuation and foaming at 36 degrees. So it could could be a number of things, whether it's a jetter or your fobbing process, um, a number of different ways that you can help to try to continue to chip those down and figure out what's giving you good returns versus marginal returns. Yeah, it's it's so gratifying to um, to discover. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's scary to discover. You know, a, a big problem like that. But it's so gratifying when you can go in and then make a small adjustment that has such a a massive impact. I'll never forget the time I did that on a keg line, and um, I think added you know months of shelf life to the beer with a, a simple adjustment that you know greatly impacted the amount of oxygen going into the keg. So. Um, it's very gratifying to to chase those problems down. Um, I, I know that's the most fun that Kevin and I have when we're in a facility uh, separately or together, when we can come in and help a facility that has a new part of their process, whether it's filtering or, or a new canner, and being able to help them not only demonstrate how to use and what kind of information one can gather on an instrument, but actually help them knock down those those measurements and yeah, then yeah, celebrate. We- Celebrate over some low TPO. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we installed we installed a TPO analyzer in one of Mike's um, customers' uh, facilities, and w- once we got it up and running, within thirty minutes, we were out adjusting their their jetter, and we knocked their TPO a, a third within ten fifteen minutes of of installing a TPO analyzer and just making measurement. <laughs> That was Mike Feldman and Kevin Sutterth from Hawk here on the Master Brewers Podcast. Visit community.mbaa.com if you'd like to connect with them or check out the District New England Presentations Archive where you can download their DO Measurements presentation. That's under the Meetings tab at mbaa.com. Did you know that Master Brewers now has a mobile app? TQ articles, podcasts, webinars, Ask the Brewmasters, and more, all in the same place. Search Master Brewers in the App Store to download it now. And then I fought on the ground. 130 years ago, Master Brewers was built on the concept of brewers helping each other out so we could all make the best possible beer. That's still true to this day, and it's where a lot of the camaraderie in this industry originated. Master Brewers' award-winning Ask the Brewmasters is the best place to go for troubleshooting, where you'll find the industry's only discussion forum that's moderated for technical accuracy by a team of experts. See what everyone else is talking about at community.mbaa.com. My fist full of courage, my heart 
full of rage well, I can't get stuck, I can't be losing too much And then I'm heading out to any other place Can't get stuck, I can't be losing too 